All right. Good evening. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, we uh, welcome to tonight's version of the colorectal surgery virtual education series, and we are very pleased to have with us Dr. Mary Lise Boutros uh, joining us to speak about low anterior resection syndrome. Um, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Boutros recently moved to the Cleveland Clinic, Florida, where she's now professor of surgery there. But prior to that, uh, she was a colorectal surgeon at um, Jewish General Hospital and associate professor of surgery at McGill University in Montreal. Uh, she did her colorectal surgery fellowship at Cleveland Clinic, Florida, and uh, is returning uh, there to continue the work that she started um, in patient reported outcomes and looking at uh, low anterior resection syndrome and integrating that into practice. She's also previously played a role as program director of the colorectal surgery residency program at McGill and um, is a federally and provincially uh, funded researcher and also internationally uh, recognized in uh, the work that she's done with patient-centered interventions and patient-reported outcome measures in colorectal surgery. Um, we are very excited to have her join us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Boutrous, and uh, I'll hand the mic over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I think it's, it's a really special place to be talking to all of you who are going to be in practice um, in a few months' time. And uh, we were just chatting that you're like midway through all your training, uh, this special year of training. So real privilege to be with you and to talk about a topic that I love. Um, these are my disclosures and they are in no way related to um, what we're going to be speaking about today. So I'm like preaching to the choir. Um, we all know that colorectal cancer is one of the most common cancers. Thankfully, the overall rates of colorectal cancer are decreasing. However, as you all have seen, I'm sure um, in clinical work, uh, though the rates in the age group above 50 are is going down, the rates in the young are escalating. And unfortunately, this is even more pronounced in terms of rectal cancer um, and the young. So the rate of rectal cancer in the young are, is exponentially rising. And uh, this is important when we're going to be talking about functional outcomes and LARS. So over the past uh, decades, we've gotten pretty good at saving the sphincter. Uh, we can go lower. We have TATME. We have robotics. We have a lot of great technique enable, enabling us to be able to do good oncologic sphincter sparing operations. So more and more people are able to have restorative proctectomies. In addition, we have better multidisciplinary care and we're giving a lot more um, neoadjuvant treatment up front, able to salvage sphincters. So in total, we've really improved long-term survival and we've increased the rates of sphincter sparing operations. At the same time, as I was mentioning, we have a dramatic increase in the rate of uh, rectal cancer in young people. Altogether, this really has created a growing uh, population of rectal cancer survivors. So a lot of young people who are rectal cancer free, thankfully due to good treatment, but are suffering consequences of the treatment. And we know from cross-sectional studies that over 70% of people um, after a restorative proctectomy will experience some form of disordered bowel function in the first year. Unfortunately, about half of people will have long-term dysfunction that correlates with significantly impaired quality of life. And so this is a problem and a growing problem. Um, and we're gonna get. We're gonna be uh, talking a lot more about LARS and and how, what characterizes it. But we'll just spend a minute thinking about the pathophysiology of LARS. And like like most complex things, it's multi multifactorial, and we don't know the entire story. For sure, loss of the rectal reservoir has a big part to do with it. In addition, when we mobilize the descending colon uh, to bring it down, we create autonomic denervation of the colon, which in mouse models has sh shown to create increased colonic motility, um, it, rendering patients having the clustering phenomenon that's um, pathognomonic of LARS. In addition to some radiation to the pelvis, 
as well as staplers through the sphincters. So we decrease uh, anal sensitivity as well as anal resting pressure. Altogether, this creates the phenomenon of LARS as we know it. LARS has been around for a while or known for a while, but relatively studied in a new way now. So Bill Heald in the 1990s, he remarked that when he does a total mesorectal excision and anastomosis the patient at three centimeters versus six centimeters from the anal verge, he saw a difference in function with of course, worse function at three centimeters from the anal verge. This is as early as 1992. At the same time at Memorial Sloan Kettering, they noted that only about half of patients after restorative proctectomy had good or excellent function with the remainder having subpar function. So surgeons were noticing impaired function after restorative proctectomy pretty early on, but we weren't doing much about it. I searched hard in the literature to see when was the first time that low anterior resection syndrome was coined as a syndrome and how it was defined. And I found it tucked away in this review article in the year 2000. And basically they described that anywhere between a quarter to half of patients have had impaired function after restorative proctectomy with varying degrees of urgency, frequent bowel movements and fecal incontinence. But it's only in 2012 really when our colleagues in Denmark decided to score low anterior resection syndrome that we got a lot more meat on the topic. So they created a score that is really a simple score consisting of five elements, frequency, urgency, incontinence to liquids, to gas, and clustering. And the way they did this is that they asked over a thousand of their patients to tell them what were the symptoms that bothered them most. And it was an iterative process. They then anchored that to a very simple question. How much does your bowel function bother, impact your quality of life? A lot, a little bit, or none. And it came down to these five symptoms and five questions, and they anchored the score. It's a, a score over 30 on 42 correlates with a major impact on quality of life. So if patients have major LARS, you know that this is tied to a major impact on quality of life. They then, what they did is they tested this LARS score against other well-known um, quality of life metrics that were a bit more robust than the one question. So they used the European Organization of Research and Training in Cancer, a 30 item questionnaire. And they found that the LARS score, again, major LARS was predictive of overall global health status at three months and 12 months after proctectomy. They then went on and collaborated with Swedish, Spanish, and German colleagues, put a cohort of 800 patients together, and they looked at LARS score and how it correlated with quality of life. And again, this is not a Danish phenomenon. Major LARS denoted in green here significantly impacted overall quality of life, but it also impacted patients' physical functioning, their ability to fulfill their role, so role functioning, impaired emotions, and social functioning. So quite pervasive. And they built on this work bit by bit, giving us a much better understanding really of LARS and its implications on people's recovery. They then also did another elegant study that I, I like to point out. And they surveyed people at two time points around a median of five years after proctectomy and then um, 10 years after proctectomy. And what they found is that LARS is pretty much here to stay. So they found that most patients at five years, when they resurveyed them again at 10 years, stayed in the same category. 75% stayed in the same category. If they had major LARS, 10 years later, they still had major LARS. 15% of people improved and only 10% of people got worse. So the take home message from this paper is that if patients have long-term LARS, it's really here to stay. It's not something that will go away or get better um, in time. Most recently, um, there was a Scandinavian collaboration looking at LARS longitudinally, which of course tells us a little bit more about how it, how it performs the score. And what they found is that major LARS was happening at around over 60% of patients at the first year after proctectomy, and that didn't decrease by much at two years at 56%. So this is 
major LARS is really uh, major and pervasive and prevalent um, in our rectal cancer survivors. So despite all this great work on the LARS score going on in Scandinavia, the uptake in the literature when we do research work on rectal cancer or in our clinical work really isn't that great. Celia Keane and Ian Bissett from New Zealand did a systematic review looking at all papers, um, looking at functional outcomes after rectal cancer and looked to see what metric was used to measure functional outcomes. They found that the most common metric is none at all. And we're just reporting symptoms in our papers followed by the Wexner fecal incontinence score. And of course, any of you who have seen patients with LARS know that it's a bit more than just mere incontinence. The LARS score itself was only used in eight papers. This is 2017, so five years after the LARS score was published, but not a major uptake. I can only imagine what's happening in our clinical work and how much we're really using the LARS score. Another problem with the LARS score, other than the poor uptake, is that it's not that sensitive. So the Danish group did a really elegant study. What they did is they said, let's figure out the sensitivity of this LARS score. They gave the LARS score to a national survey to over 3,000 Danish citizens, normal population, people who have not had any colorectal surgery, have not had cancer, have not had a prophectomy. And what they found is that about 20% of older women and 10% of older men had major LARS, despite not having a low anterior resection. That tells us that it's not measuring something very specific. To the, to the operation itself and rectal cancer treatment itself. Our research group looked at this because there was no such data in North America. Jenny Moon, who's gonna be doing her colorectal fellowship next year, um, surveyed over 500 patients who were undergoing a screening colonoscopy who have had no um, colorectal surgery and found similar results where 11% of women and 7% of men had major LARS and overall, 26% of patients had some uh, degree of LARS, again, without having any colorectal surgery. So the LARS score, though robust in the way it was developed, and though it correlates with quality of life, um, perhaps may not be that sensitive. This led to um, an international consensus work that's still in progress. So the first stage was a physician and patient Delphi. This was over 300 participants and we um, uh, used patients' feedback and patients' opinion in multiple iterative cycles, as well as with colorectal surgeons. And what we did is we identified a new definition for low anterior resection syndrome. The first thing is that a patient must have undergone a low anterior resection in order to have the syndrome. So that's the first part of the definition. Second, eight symptoms came out as the highest priority. And so a patient would have to have at least one symptom and then one consequence of the symptom. Because if they have frequency, but it's not impacting their quality of life, well, then it's not that important. But it has to have a bother or a consequence. So the new definition for LARS is a patient who's undergone a low anterior resection and has at least one of eight symptoms with at least one consequence. And uh, that was published in 2020. And since then, we're working on a new score as an international group so that we can measure this definition. And hopefully it can be more specific to patients who have undergone uh, a low anterior resection and can be sensitive to change also. <clears throat> and again, we're creating the score with the input of multiple patients who are suffering with LARS. So more to be continued there, hopefully in time. So other than measuring LARS, which is interesting and all, what really fueled my passion for LARS is patients in clinic, because they would come to clinic and you could see, I'm so excited, especially early in practice, that I was able to do a really great proctectomy, very distal, do sphincter sparing operations when you know, you're so happy when they have no complications, great oncologic outcomes. And yet I saw that patients were distraught. Um, I love this editorial that Susan Glendiak um, wrote last year, prefacing an article that I'll tell you about that I really liked. And she said, we have paid less attention to the most important data regarding surgical outcomes, those provided by our patients. And it's really what our patients say um, that fueled my passion for this um, 
problem. And I'm hoping in the next few minutes to excite you about Lars when I tell you a little bit about what patients are saying. What Susan was saying is yet, yeah, how many of us personally follow these patients long-term to see them struggle with major Lars? in some cases so severe that it makes our patients essentially homebound. And how many of us help the, us, uh, how many of us help them mitigate these symptoms with behavioral modification or pharmacologic therapy? And how can we adequately counsel patients preoperatively? So there were lots of challenges. This is kind of how I felt about Lars. And I felt as she is saying about a decade before she this editorial that we really need to provide our patients with accurate information regarding the impact of our interventions um, before they have surgery so they can plan their other activities and their lives, fertility and et cetera. So what are our patients really saying? This was a super elegant study, unusual um, qualitative study in DCNR last year. And what it was is what's called a photo elicitation study. They asked 20 patients basically to take photographs of their daily lives that described their lived experience with Lars. And this is an excerpt of what patients showed. So one patient um, took a uh, uh, a picture of his boat and, and said, you know, he's having a hard time letting go of his boat, but because of Lars, he no longer goes on boat rides because he needs to be near a toilet. Another rectal cancer survivor took a picture of all this, you know, yummy roughage um, and saying they can no longer eat salads and, and fresh vegetables like this, again, because of the impact it has on their bowel function. Yet another patient took a picture of a bathroom at 3.30 in the morning um, because that's where they are in the middle of the night, waking up with multiple bowel movements. And the last picture is of like a little bowel emergency first aid kit that patients are carrying around with them and traveling wherever they go with, um, you know, in order to feel safe. Most of the patients in our waiting room come and they haven't eaten or drank because they're afraid to have an accident. I think this is quite telling about the impact of Lars on people's lives. In preparing for this talk, I said, let me find you know what's new out there. And I actually found what was old. This paper is published a year after the Lars score is defined. So even before anybody knew about the Lars score, really an older paper, and this comes from the nursing literature, but I love the, the title and it says it all um, tied to the toilet. This is what our patients are living with. And they identified many themes that our patients are feeling, again, through qualitative uh, design. Uh, this study, this was a framework analysis, and they found that patients felt insecure. They had a lack of a daily routine because they didn't know when this you know, episodic clustering bowel movement would come on. The total unpredictability of their bowel movements made them feel like they've lost control, their inability to plan they felt vulnerable, and they felt like they were paddling and muddling through life. Um, and one respondent said, I've got to be very careful of how far I can go before I need the toilet, and that stops me wanting to go out really, it's not worth the risk. And so it's quite pervasive, um, the impact of these this disordered bowel movement on our patients. What we did is we uh, under, performed a cross-sectional study um, in our rectal cancer patients at McGill, it was 150 patients. And basically we just saw who has major LARS and we found that um, about a third had major LARS in our cohort. Um, and then we administered a financial stress and strain questionnaire, Richard Garfinkel uh, did this work. And we found surprisingly that 50% of our patients in a publicly funded healthcare system, so it wasn't really paying for any of their healthcare, it's more about the impact of LARS on their ability to make ends meet um, and to get back to their jobs is what we discovered um, were impacted. So 50% of patients with major LARS had significant financial stress and strain. And when we delved into it, it was about their inability to return to work because of their disordered bowel function. So some delayed their return to work, some changed their schedule. So they work different hours because of their bowel movements. Some had to change their role and some took early retirement or long-term disability. They were just not able to return to work. Um, so definitely has a very big impact on our patients. We delved into this, um, into a qualitative study further 
And again, we came down to the tied to the toilet theme. A patient said that they felt like a prisoner, um, to put it simply, because the bowel movements are so unpredictable that they can't plan their day um, and they can't create a reasonable occupational adaptation for their LARS and that they're not finding much help from the healthcare system or healthcare professionals on how to manage all of this. When we found these results, we said, well, let's look at a larger level. So we used a UK database um, that is managed by primary care physicians. So it has a lot of rich data to look at the impact of a proctectomy on mental health disorders. <clears throat> and what we found is that a third of our rectal cancer patients, well, this is in the UK, but I don't think that any of ours are different. A third of them will develop a new mental health disorder um, within, the within the five years after proctectomy. And that is either due to a psychiatric diagnosis that requires medication or a visit to a psychiatrist. So our patients are really impacted um, by our treatment, despite being cancer-free, uh, our disordered bowel function and the other things that can ensue like sexual and urinary dysfunction also are really impacting um, our patients. We're going to look at this prospectively. We just got funded um, in over 20 North American centers where we're going to follow patients from diagnosis into survivorship for three years. We're going to look at bowel, sexual and urinary dysfunction because I feel like we need to characterize this better so we can tell our patients and prepare them better. We're also going to look at the financial impact, the mental health impact, and try to uncover all the unmet needs that our patients have. So stay tuned for this. All right. So I hope I've convinced you that there is a problem. What can we do about it? Well, the first thing we can do is we can predict who's going to have a problem. And there are several risk factors in the literature work by Richard Garfinkel again and many others in the literature. We all know that radiation increases the risk of uh, low anterior resection syndrome. Bill Heal told us and many other studies that the lower the tumor height as well as the lower the anastomosis, the worse the symptoms. We found that female sex uh, is also associated with worse off Lars. An interesting finding in more than one paper is that younger age, I would have guessed older age because of just uh, physiological poorer function uh, of the sphincter. However, time and time again in multiple different cohorts, younger age has been associated with worse LARS. And I presume that that's probably because younger age people have a better starting baseline. And so the decline is probably more impactful on them and that younger people have so many other commitments and things they need to do that the, LAR the LARS probably impairs them and impacts them more. Having a stoma and the time or duration of diversion is also associated with LARS as well as anastomotic leak, making the entire pelvis fibrotic um, and gives worse function. Battersby's group in the UK collaborated with the Danish group and what they did is they created the POLAR score, which is a predictive preoperative score of how bad LARS can be. So just with these simple variables, age, sex, the extent of the TME, the tumor height, whether a stoma is planned or not, and whether there's pre-op radiotherapy, you can predict for your patient and show them with this nice nomogram here that's available online, um, what their risk of LARS is, and you can talk to them about LARS in the preoperative setting. So we can predict who has LARS and we can um, gear our counseling to the degree or risk of LARS uh, that will ensue. My colleague at McGill, Larry Lee, used the LARS score in the pretreatment setting when the patient has the tumor in place, although of course that's not what the LARS score is for, but he said, hey, can the LARS score itself predict LARS postoperatively? And indeed, he found if you have major LARS before treatment, you're a much higher chance of having major LARS after treatment. So perhaps just doing the LARS score, another way that we can predict um, who is gonna have uh, poor function. All right, so once we predict, we need to prepare our patients. We conducted a focus group um, on our rectal cancer patients at McGill. And despite my passion for LARS and really feeling that I do a good job talking to patients about LARS, 
our patients felt really underprepared for their new bowel function. They actually thought it was a complication, and this is something I've seen time and time again now as more literature is arising on LARS. Patients feel like they're the only one, that something went wrong with their operation, and they feel alone and isolated because it's a pretty sensitive topic to talk about. And I mean, who's interested in hearing about your bowel function outside of your healthcare professionals? And so they feel isolated by this also because they can't go out and do much because they're tied to the toilet. So if we're gonna preoperatively counsel patients, when are we gonna do it? Because at the time of rectal cancer diagnosis, our patients have information overload. We're asking them to choose between multiple treatment strategies. We're telling them tons of information about sequential treatment over about a year's period. Jason Park, when, we, when he was at Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, uh, performed this very nice qualitative uh, study, look, speaking to patients about when is the best time to talk to them about their disordered bowel function that will ensue. And patients said preoperatively before any treatment, the most important thing is to be cancer free. And another patient said, right now, I just got this thing in my mind about the surgery. I just can't think of anything else. It's information overload. And yet another patient said, when asked, are you concerned at all about what your bowel function will be like? They said, you know what? It's so far in the future at this point, I'm not focused on it yet. Other literature shows that patients are different. Some patients want to know up front. Some patients want to know later. What I found in my clinical experience is, yes, of course, at the beginning, we have to mention LARS. We have to um, help patients make an informed decision between an APR and restorative proctectomy. But beyond that, counseling on how to manage LARS, what to expect, the tra trajectory and all these details may be information overload for most patients at the time of diagnosis. A great time I find is prior to ileostomy closure. So this can typically be a pretty quick visit to make sure they're okay and plan surgery. However, it would be ideal, I feel, if we can take the time or if we can have the personnel with us helping us to take the time to really start to teach and preoperatively counsel patients at this time. Because patients think it's a small operation and I'll be back to normal. Little do they know that they have a very new normal. All right, so we can prepare patients. Uh, we can also prevent LARS. And really there's not too much we can do to prevent it completely. The main thing we can do to mitigate LARS is um, reconstructive techniques. And so, uh, we feel good about, as surgeons, we really want to do something to make things better. So the typical is an end-to-end -end anastomosis. We can perform a colonic J pouch, a side-to-end anastomosis, and a transverse coloplasty has been described in the literature, but has pretty much fallen to the wayside. There are multiple systematic reviews looking at this, but whichever way you look at it, um, basically, when you compare a straight colonial anastomosis to any form of reconstruction, the maximum is that you will improve stool frequency in the first 18 months after proctectomy. After that, everything levels out and is the same. In terms of other symptoms, such as incontinence and urgency, incomplete defecation, no real difference between any of the reconstructive techniques and a straight anastomosis. On the flip side, there are no added complications uh, of performing a colonic J pouch or a side to end. Uh, coloplasty, as you see here, um, in meta-analysis does not reach significance. However, in single studies has been um, problematic with increased leak, leak rates and thus has fallen to the wayside. A recent uh, randomized control trial compared a straight anastomosis to a side to end or a colonic J pouch found no difference in evacuation or incontinence. And similarly, uh, another randomized control trial comparing a side to end versus a clonic J pouch, no difference in bowel function or quality of life up to two years. So how do we put this together? Basically, uh, my feeling is that any reconstructive technique that you can do over a straight uh, and anastomosis will improve um, frequency in the first 18 months, and I advocate for it. Surgical morbidity is no different. 
And um, my preference is for a side to end anastomosis or a Baker anastomosis. It's easy to do. It uh, doesn't require as much colon or mobilization and has no added morbidity. I actually think it makes a really nice anastomosis. And so that's my preferred go-to whenever technically feasible. All right. So once we've done all this preoperative work, we've done a reconstruction if we can, what is the next step? And what can we do? Well, the cornerstone um, is really the patient managing their own LARS. And first and foremost, we need to ask if they're having symptoms of LARS because patients will not uh, willingly divulge their symptoms in most cases. In this great study in a nursing journal, again, 100 patients post-proctectomy, only a third of them voiced uh, their bowel dysfunction to a healthcare professional. And of that group, half voiced it to a primary care physician or a nurse practitioner, and only half voiced it to their colorectal uh, surgeon or oncologist. And so this is a pretty um, sensitive and difficult topic. And many patients feel like, well, my surgeon's not interested in my diarrhea or because they don't even know the name of what they have. And so if we don't ask, patients often will just try to troubleshoot it on their own and not bring it up. In the Netherlands, who are definitely ahead of us in managing LARS, um, they conducted a survey of colorectal surgeons as well as colorectal care nurses, over 240 of them. And they asked them, what proportion of patients do you feel have LARS in your practice? And they answered 20 to 40%, when we know indeed it is more like 60 to 80%. And they asked if who is um, doing uh, routine screening for LARS uh, and, and bowel dysfunction preoperatively and LARS postoperatively, and they found that the majority were not routinely screening for it. So I think the onus is on us uh, to screen for LARS. It's really easy. And what I do in my clinic is, it was actually our um, oncology nurse who said, you know, I think we should measure the LARS score in clinic. Um, this was about 10 years ago that she said that. I said, yeah, that's a great idea, Louise, let's do it. And so patients fill out LARS scores while they're waiting in the waiting room. That signals to them that this is important. This is relevant for this visit um, that you're coming for. And then it is also a quantitative way of understanding quickly the impact on the patient. And right away, you can score it and know if they have major LARS or not. So you can create like your dot phrase or whatever, have it in the chart, have your nurse go through it with them if they can't do it in the waiting room on their own. And that way you'll have the information right there and you've opened the door for the discussion um, to help them. All right, so you uncover it, you find it, they have LARS. Now, what are you going to do about it? Well, there are a plethora of things to do. Again, the cornerstone is self-management behaviors, whether it be altering their diet, using anti-diarrheal medications, using good perianal skin management, and then managing their lives according to their symptoms. In an elegant study um, out of China, two tertiary care centers, over 175 rectal cancer patients, they found that there was over 18 strategies that patients were using. And they found that regardless of the strategies being used, the increase in number of strategies that patients were employing um, was correlated with the success in improving their bowel movements. They found that diet self-management is the most common behavior. As I mentioned, many of the patients coming to see me in clinic don't eat before they come. That's what they do. And many will avoid certain foods that they found to be triggers. Uh, while they also found that medication self-management using antidiarrheals and bulking agents was the most effective uh, management in their study. In Belgium, they, con uh, they um, conducted a qualitative study asking patients about what they wanted in terms of information and support with in terms of management of their LARS. And some of these excerpts I thought were quite striking. These are 28 patients and these are a few of the excerpts. But they said, I actually found that everything was arranged from beginning to end during treatment. But once treatment is over, you're actually on your own. And that's what I find so difficult because I don't really have any idea either. So they're experiencing this whole new normal and they're on their own. We really don't have a structured way of helping them. 
I do not think that they informed me beforehand. It's possible, but that was such a hard period. It was all just, when I think about it now, as if I were driving an autopilot. Again, they're on their own. Another patient said, I was treated very well by the surgeon. I can't complain about that. He, all, he gave me the medical explanations, the possible medical complications, what to expect. He did that all very well. But I what I really missed is someone there. I do not know who, possibly a nurse, who could give you advice on the physical consequences, such as incontinence. That may be insignificant for someone else, but for me, it was very important. And other patients talked about the importance of emotional counseling and just helping them get through this other aspect. Um, and yet another patient talked about the importance of peers and talking with other people, recognizing that they're not a one-off or a complication. So this was just published last year, but um, the, this qualitative study that I mentioned, but um, a couple of years before in the Netherlands, they created a screening and guidance protocol. And what they did is 50 patients, and they basically screened for Larson, these 50 patients, and gave them very simple self-management advice to follow. They managed LAR scores in this group and compared it to historical controls and found that LAR scores were significantly better and the rate of major LARS was 50% in their historical controls and about 26% when they did the screening and guidance protocol. So we need to teach patients how to do self-management. They first need to learn what is low anterior resection syndrome. Many of our patients don't even know the term. Um, Richard Garfinkel, uh, when he was doing his PhD, said, okay, well, what, what are we going to, what our patients don't have any materials. We don't really have any education materials for our patients. Perhaps they'll turn to the internet. We looked at what's available on the internet and we found that it was um, pretty dodgy little things here and there. Maybe it's gotten better in the last few years, um, but it's not written at their, uh, at the sixth grade uh, language level that is supposed to be written for patients. There were not any pictures or things that were easy to follow and explanations. And so we then created uh, with our patient education office, a booklet on LARS, an education booklet for patients on LARS. And we created pictures as you see here, just explaining normal physiology, the abnormal pathophysiology of what's happening. So they know what's going on inside their body. Um, we explained about stool consistency. We created bowel and food diaries and medication diaries. And what we did is we launched this program as a randomized control trial at multi-center at the time of stoma closure, because that's really where I feel all the counseling needs to happen. And they would get the booklet before stoma closure and they would get nurse guidance throughout the one year after stoma closure. So reiterating and supporting them, not really prescribing any medications, but being a sounding board and a support system. And we just closing our trial now, and hopefully we will see the impact of such a program, essentially having a LARS nurse. And our nurse in the study has gone on to function as a LARS nurse and has become an incredible resource um, for our patients. Jenny Moon worked with Richard Garfinkel and turned the booklet into an app. And then we taught rectal cancer survivors who really worked through their LARS to support other rectal cancer survivors through a formal peer mentorship program. And we ran that on a, a, a forum for patients and uh, we performed a multi-center randomized control trial on that. And that has since closed and we found a significant improvement in quality of life. And really all the tricks I learned to managing LARS, I learned from patients. And so um, hopefully tools such as this one can be open to patients everywhere and we can open the peer support forum and grow it online uh, for our LARS community. We looked at some of the posts on the forum and saw like what kind of advice are they giving each other? And we were monitoring the forum, although we didn't have to intervene much. And so in terms of clinical advice, the top three alleviating factors that patients found were using use of an enema or transanal irrigation, which I'll tell you about shortly in our stepwise approach for managing LARS, um, fiber and emodium. So just tricks about very simple things to manage LARS. And the top aggravating factors were spicy foods, seeds, and caffeine. All right, so the cornerstone of medical therapy, like any colorectal office, is fiber and water um, and or antidiarrheal agents. And there's really no data on these and the, their success in managing LARS, yet that's what we recommend to all our patients. And most of this comes from fecal incontinence literature or comes from IBS diarrhea literature. The newer kids on the block 
have some literature that goes with them. And so we'll go through that now. A study that really harps and, and, and shows us that really this fiber and anti-diarrheal uh, anti medication is all we really need uh, is, a, is a study that was really nicely designed by Dina Harji in the UK. And what they did in 100 rectal cancer patients who they followed out for a year from stoma closure is it was a stepwise treatment of their LARS and patients would progress every three months if they had no improvement in their LARS scores. And so they found that three quarters of patients only needed dietary management, as well as antidiarrheals. And that was it. They didn't even do enemas. Another 14% went on to biofeedback and transanal irrigation. One patient went on to sacral neuromodulation and one patient went on to a colostomy. So really the bulk of the work is just teaching patients how to manage uh, their expectations and how to manage their diet antidiarrheals, antifiber, and, and fiber products, and at most using transanal irrigation. And here you see the orange line is the medical therapy group over the one year period. Really it's predominant, the predominant uh, portion of the cohort. Um, serotonin receptor antagonists have garnered some uh, enthusiasm in the last two years. So this is a randomized control trial out of Korea, 100 male patients who are randomized to having ramesterone, which is the serotonin receptor antagonist, or not uh, having control. And this thought came from IBS diarrhea, where these drugs are used. And what they found is that the rate of major LARS went from 80% in control to about 60% in their ramesterone group. And the first three months after proctectomy are, are really um, difficult for patients. So if you could give them one pill once a day um, and decrease you know, at least 25% of, of the burden, I think that's wonderful. However, this was only in male patients and was in Korea. Uh, just hot off the press here, um, a smaller trial published in the annals uh, a month ago, uh, Zofran being used in a placebo-controlled crossover trial, uh, 38 patients in the intention to treat analysis, so very small trial, a little bit flawed because we know LARS improves slowly over time or people adapt to it at least slowly over time in the first two years. And they included patients anywhere in the first two years, not like the Korean trial where people were in included um, at the time of ileostomy closure. They gave them Zofran for four weeks, but they still saw an improvement in major LARS. Hard to interpret. So here you see if they started out um, in the Zofran group, their major LARS was 41%. When they got off Zofran, their major LARS was 76%. However, if it was done in the reverse order where they started off Zofran, the rate of major LARS was 77% and on Zofran, 57%. So regardless of the effect size, there is a significant decrease in major LARS. Zofran is readily available and perhaps can be added to our armamentarium as we get more data um, on the use of Zofran. There were no uh, major adverse events with, with this. And so it's looking promising, uh, a one pill helping uh, with Lars. All right, so that's the medical therapy. What else can we do? What about pelvic floor rehab? Well, the data on pelvic floor rehab is all mixed up. A, because there's many different types of pelvic floor rehab. Secondly, because people are using all sorts of outcome measures to measure improvement. This was a systematic review done about 10 years ago, included five studies and just under 300 patients, and they could not meta-analyze any of the data because of these problems. However, they found improved outcomes in about four studies. A more helpful uh, paper that was just published last year in the Annals of Surgery looked at this exact question, and what they did is they randomized patients to um, pelvic floor rehab starting one month after proctectomy or closure ileostomy, and it went on for three months. And major Lars is in, is in black. And as you can see, um, the rates of major Lars significantly decreased at four months. So just at the time the intervention ended and that persisted to six months where major Lars was significantly uh, less in the treatment group. However, at 12 months, this difference didn't persist. 
So the take home from this study is that pelvic floor rehab, and this consisted of both strengthening exercises, EMG and biofeedback led uh, pelvic floor muscle retraining, as well as rectal balloon training, um, will improve uh, major LARS uh, during treatment and at least one to three months after treatment. However, perhaps it needs to, pelvic floor muscle training needs to go on for longer or should only be used in the short term, but its um, effect is not long lasting. Still very helpful to decrease rates of major LARS. So the next thing is uh, that's become one of my favorites is transanal irrigation. Many years ago, I would just teach patients to use a tap water enema or use the same fleet enema that they use to come uh, to do before coming for their surveillance check and flex sig. Just tell them do that fleet enema, empty out your rectum. It might give you some relief overnight or free you up for a few hours of the day. Uh, however, there are true transanal irrigation devices, ones that have a soft catheter and then a balloon that inflates to occlude the anus with a pump and a large reservoir that allows you to fill the colon with a liter to a liter and a half of fluid, and then let the balloon uh, empty and let the colon empty so that you've essentially bowel prepped uh, your colon. Um, and that's uh, transanal irrigation. It's uh, FDA approved and being used for fecal incontinence and for constipation. However, um, not being used for Lars, our colleagues in Denmark yet again, um, really pioneered using this for Lars. And since then, um, an Italian group published 27 patients and, of course, decreasing the number of bowel movements from multiple to just one a day when the patients do the irrigation and dropping large scores significantly. And then the German said, let's do a uh, trial where what if we just started at one month post-restorative proctectomy and not wait till patients, you know, have troubleshooted with diet and other self-management strategies. And they also showed that it was effective and safe if it's used early on uh, post proctectomy. And so what we did is we created a um, nurse led virtual program, uh, Canada being geographically large, and we wanted to offer this to as many patients as we could. So this we taught patients online through a nurse, um, how to do transanal irrigation and we performed our own multi center randomized crossover trial. We're two thirds of the way through. Um, so I don't have results to share with you yet, but we have anecdotal patients telling us all the time that they do not want to cross over uh, because they are super happy and it's totally changed their lives because now they have control. They do the irrigation and they have one bowel movement a day. Most patients don't need to do the irrigation every day. They'll do it every two to three days and they really regain control over their lives. While we were working on our trial, a uh, trial got published in the Annals of Surgery. They recruited 45 patients, but only have follow-up in 16 of the patients and control arm 22 in the treatment arm, but they did observe, of course, improved LARS and thankfully improved quality of life because transanal irrigation does take 20 to 30 minutes for patients to do and needs a motivated patient. So my question is, would it really improve quality of life? Is it a good trade-off? And the answer is yes from the annals trial and hopefully our data will show the same thing. So finally, we're getting to the few and far between that need it, but sacral neuromodulation, very successful for fecal incontinence. Can it be used for LARS? We know that fecal incontinence is a portion of LARS. Uh, first systematic review in 2019 included 95 patients with one year follow-up and showed that there were significant improvements in Wexner fecal incontinence score, as well as in the LARS score. Um, <clears throat> Any more recent systematic review and meta-analysis where the primary outcome was the number of clinically beneficial sacral neuromodulators because every study defines success differently. Um, and they found that overall 77% of patients who underwent sacral neuromodulation uh, reaped clinical benefit, depending on how it was defined by each study. About a 10-point improvement in the Wexner fecal incontinence score, as well as a decrease in about 10 episodes of fecal incontinence per week when they pulled results. That's pretty significant impact. In my clinical experience, I found that sacral neuromodulation is helpful in LARS patients who um, have a, a good 
fecal incontinence component to what they're experiencing. Rather than the patients who have a clustering component, in my personal experience, I have not found it to help them as much. The Polaris study uh, run by Julie Cornish out of Wales will compare transanal irrigation to sacral neuromodulation. So stay tuned. I think that will be an interesting study. All right, now we're getting to desperation. If really things are very bad, um, anti-grade enemas, so uh, a percutaneous cecostomy has been described in the literature endoscopically placed. This is not part of my clinical armamentarium, but I wanted to share it with you guys because it's been described. Uh, about 25 patients, eight of them had local abscess, 8% eight sorry, had local abscesses. Not my favorite thing to do percutaneous cecostomy. But this is kind of like bridging them over to a colostomy because nothing is working in terms of improving their quality of life. They irrigate their colon antegrade uh, once a day and they can forget about their colon. Um, patients can be transitioned from the this secostomy over to a permanent colostomy if this really improves their quality of life. And in Danish cohorts, about under 4% of patients will eventually... Um, need a colostomy. So these are my LARS action items, keep them in mind. A lot of it is preoperative work in setting expectations, screening for LARS and teaching patients how to manage their own LARS. And this is my treatment algorithm. Thank you. And thanks to the group behind all the work that I've done. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Beatrice. That was a very thorough and very informative um, talk. I have learned a lot. And I'm just going to uh, ask a couple questions as other people are trying to collect their thoughts and, and post theirs. Um, could, do you mind going back to your, your uh, just one slide to your flow chart of your, your stepwise fashion? So with all this new data with transrectal irrigation, um, do you think that it should be offered sooner than than the six to 12 month range, given like all the anecdotal evidence and especially your app uh, or the the um, sorry, the peer support app, like where, yes. where patients are actually suggesting that earlier. I, that's a phenomenal question. I think so. I think once you're sure that the anastomosis is healed and you're happy, I think it's great to introduce it early. And that's kind of like I move this up here. Um, I think. It, we can introduce it earlier. Some of my colleagues had mentioned, I wonder if it makes like people's bowels lazy because they don't have to like make bowel movements. Uh, but people have found, and we'll see what our crossover trial shows. But once you stop do, doing the transanal irrigations, people go back to their normal bowel function, whatever their normal is. So I do think, and I do agree with uh, the Germans who tried that early on, they tried it at one month. I think that's a little early, but once the anastomosis is healed and the patient is really struggling, um, this might get them back to work. Um, because really it's like, you, you take that 20 minutes, half an hour, figure it out. It takes some dexterity for sure, but then you're, you don't have bowel movements for a day, two, three, depending on the patient, and they really regain control over their lives. So I agree. Um, and then we have some questions from Sir John. Uh, Dr. Vuong was wondering, what are the three main things you would tell a primary care physician about helping their patients if they are suspecting LARS in your post-op patient? Oh, wow. I love it. Um, so three things. I should make this into a slide after. But um, that A, it's normal. It's not a complication. And I, I cut, I didn't include it, but I had a lot of excerpts that we, and we do it all the time. We tell them it's going to go away. And right. We discharge them after ileostomy closure and we tell them we'll see you in six weeks. And then like, they're going through hell and back. They're going to the bathroom 40 times a day. Um, so a it's normal. And um, second to start teaching them about the use of antidiarrheals or fiber. I think those are, very simple things that we can, primary care physicians can introduce the idea of antidiarrheals and fibers. And they've been on them, many of them during their ileostomy. So that's not new to them. And to refer them back to us, to speak to them about it and tell them that it's something that we need to manage with them. So I think those would be my three things off the top of my head. Thank you. And then um, Dr. Abib was wondering, does 
laws apply to load injury resection for diverticular uh, disease as well. Interesting point. So removing the sigmoid and anastomosing to the upper rectum does derange bowel movements um, somewhat, nothing in comparison to removing the rectum, but it does derange bowel movements and patients will have a degree of major lars, a proportion will have major lars um, with uh, just a sigmoidectomy. Uh, I think it is probably recovers uh, more than proctectomy and is less severe, but there is some disturbance in bowel function. And in some of the European randomized control trials, they've shown that the GI quality of life score is altered um, with, uh, with diverticular disease resections. So yes, there is an element of LARS, even also with transanal excisions. Uh, there is an element of LARS and it can be managed the same way, though it's milder and less and more short-lived. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed any difference in Lars between nulliparous and multiparous women? Um, no, I would have said, I would have thought so, but no, I haven't noticed and I haven't seen it in the literature either. <clears throat> um, any other questions from the audience? I have one more question then. Um, regarding the uh, peer support, is that going to be available for other patients to join um, in the near future or is it available now as a resource? Now we've turned it offline um, because we were as a team managing it um, through the study, but we realized that we didn't have to manage much. Patients were really cordial and, and very appropriate. And so I'm hoping within the next year, as we publish the LARS booklet and make it available as an addendum with our trial so that everybody can use it and have it as a PDF to you know, use for their patients, that we will bring back the peer support forum um, for and open it uh, publicly. And a couple more questions from Sir John. Um, do you see any role for prehabilitation, pelvic floor prehabilitation in patients I'm presuming in patients who have sort of a positive screen. Yeah, I think this is a great question. It's like maybe the next randomized control trial that I'd like to do. There are several registered right now on clinicaltrials.gov who are looking at prehab. Uh, I think we have a window. I think the time after proctectomy and when they have an ileostomy and they're waiting for closure, we have a window right there to do pelvic floor prehab. Uh, so the same exercises that we would be done post-op, I think based on the last randomized control trial in annals, we probably have to continue post-op, but I think golden question, golden thought, start them early. And I have a few keener patients who are really worried about their bowel function. So I tell them, well, why don't you start pelvic floor physio now? But I think they have to continue it um, after ileostomy closure as well. But yes, I think there is room for prehab. And then uh, Dr. Rothmel was wondering, uh, do you mind uh, going over the technique for rectal irrigation again uh, so that they can be taught? Sure, and, and you can feel free to contact me and I can show you. And the company actually, so there are multiple companies we're using the one by Coloplast and Peristine. They have a video on their website and they have um, multiple resources. So they just, it's not approved for LARS per se, but it's the same like for people in continents. So they're, they're a good resource, but essentially you have this soft tipped catheter that you can place in the anus um, and patients have no trouble really placing it and just instruct them on how to do it. And then there is a pump and a balloon that inflates to block the anus on the outside. And then there's a pump to, you fill this bag, with, with saline. Some patients require a liter, some patients a liter and a half, and then they pump, 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 pump so that it pushes it through their colon. And once they've emptied, put the whole amount of liquid in, they release the balloon and then they're sitting on the toilet through all of this and it evacuates. And so just, I think the get for patients to be sticking the catheter in, although many of them are good because they've done fleet enemas before when they've come for flex SIGs. 
uh, but teaching them how to put in the catheter and, and the sequence of events and, and troubleshooting, where to hang the bag, et cetera, um, is helpful. And so my research team and research nurse uh, are, have been troubleshooting with by phone, really. Um, we have we planned video calls so that people could we could show them the device and stuff, but they haven't needed it it by phone. And on the app, we have all this information and we have a video uh, by Peristeam. So you'll find this all this information online and we'll make all our stuff publicly available as soon as we close the trial. Thank you so much for the talk again. Uh, I think that's all the questions we have. So uh, I hope you have a good evening and good luck on call. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Have Take a good care. night. Uh,